think through the writings of the Apostle Paul, and uh, we're going to pick up reading in verse number 13 uh, down through uh, verse number 22. So if you're there and you're physically able, out of honor and respect for the reading of God's word, let's all stand, shall we? Verse 13, there hath no temptation taken you, but such is as common to man. But God is faithful, praise God. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which ye are able. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Behold Israel after the flesh. Are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What say I then, that the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the tables and of the, and of the table of devils. Verse 22. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? That's a rhetorical question, by the way. Are we stronger than he? Of course not. So the title of the message is, you know, I had a hard time figuring out this title, and I just had so many just thoughts kind of going on in my mind. As you see, the title of the message is, Wear the Right Colors. Wear the Right Colors. Some of you might be thinking, what in the world are you talking about? Wear the Right Colors. Well, we'll get into that, so... Let's, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for uh, the word. And Lord, we're thankful, Lord, that you have inspired the Apostle Paul, Lord, to pen these words. And, and Father, thank you for your spirit as you preserved them for us. Lord, I do ask you that you would just uh, help us, Lord, to glean from the word tonight. Help us, Lord, to, um, Father, hear from you. Uh, Lord, more importantly, that we would hear from you this evening. And Father, that we leave here and with having a greater desire to love you, having a greater desire to serve you. And Lord, we just want to praise you for who you are. Thank you, dear Lord, for loving us. We ask these things in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. All right. Thank you. You may be seated. You know, in the first 12 verses of chapter 10, just a little bit of a recap from what we talked about last Sunday night. Last Sunday night, we talked about how, well, really, Paul brought to the attention of the Corinthian church of the history of the children of Israel. And, and basically, this is what he, he said about the children of Israel. They started off right, but they didn't end right. They, they started off well, but just because they started off well doesn't mean that they ended well. And, he, and he's referring to about that very first generation that had exited out of Egypt under the leadership of Moses... And the way they started off was, listen, they had the presence of God. Listen, they they literally had something to look at that would represent his presence. They had the pillar of cloud. They had the blessings of God. They they had all those things. But of course, we know as you you study the the history of the children of Israel, uh, Paul said, not many. (laughs) And, And now, I'm not here to disagree with what Paul said, but I kind of think it's a little bit of an understatement. Listen, that entire generation died in the wilderness, all except for two. So it's just, I would say it's a little bit more than just many. (laughs) All the only ones that survived was Joshua and Caleb. And so the point of the the message that Paul was trying to get to him is this. Hey, their failures is recorded for our admonition. Their failures was recorded for our warning. And Paul was applying that to the Corinthian church and saying, hey, listen, listen, listen. Look at them. Look at their failures. When you think that you're able to handle temptation, look here. You better take heed lest ye fall. You better take heed. Now, Paul, he, this is what Paul knew. Paul knew that when temptation came, 
God's faithful when temptation comes. What Paul expresses is that the faithfulness of God enables them to escape from temptation. Look at verse 13. The Bible says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Here's what Paul's saying. He says that there's, listen, there's no temptation that's unique. There, there's no temptation that, that gives exceptions for a person to succumb to that sinful temptation. Uh, listen, they're all common to man. Okay, listen, the devil, he uses the same old tricks. Now, now they might look a little different. He might add a little twist to them. But, but listen, overall, what people of the past, they perhaps maybe face the very exact same temptation or maybe even very similar temptation. But the truth of the matter is this. There's no temptation that's unique. There's no temptation that makes exception for man to succumb to the temptation. You with me tonight? Okay. Because the Bible says that they're common to man. Okay, now let's read verse 13 again. There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Now look here. But God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able. But will with temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Here is Paul and he's saying, God will, listen, God will allow you to go through temptations. But the temptation that he allows you to go through it will not be more than you can handle. Well, why is that? Because God's faithful. And, and what God is doing is that God, he, because of his faithfulness, he will always, look here, there will always be a way of escape from the temptation. Now, the problem is, is that sometimes people, they make excuses as to why they can't get victory over sin. People make excuses. Come on. People might say, well, well you, you know what? I mean, this sin that has been a part of my life, it's too challenging for me to get victory over. It, it, it's too overwhelming for me to get victory. I've been in bondage to this sin for so long. I've been in this habit for so long of continual sin. It, it's like, you, you know, it's just like a part of who I am nowadays. And, and you know, it's like sometimes I think we kind of get in the mindset, like if we allow sin to be a part of our lives for so long, it's like we almost convince ourselves in saying, well, God knows this is how I am and he's okay with it. Well, God knows that this is just what I struggle with. And, and you know, I, I, he hasn't really bothered me a lot about it. So therefore he must be all right with it. No, listen, to argue why you can't get victory over sin is to argue against the faithfulness of God. Are you listening tonight? To argue and say, why, well, this is why I can't get victory. Or I've just done it for so many years. Or I just, this is just, I have, I'm just in so much bondage to here. It's just, it's just who I am now. Yeah, I'm just, accept this as my identity. Listen, you argue that God is not faithful. Come on, the truth of the matter is this. Many believers, they're not willing to take the way of escape that God provides. Amen. You awake? Listen to this. A little boy was standing by some candy. Looked like he was going to put some in his pocket and walk out the door. The clerk watched the boy for a long time and finally spoke to him and said, looks like you're trying to take some candy. The boy replied, you're wrong, mister. I'm trying not to. <laughs> hey, listen, when we are tempted to sin, we need to remind ourselves God's faithful to make a way of escape. God's faithful. And verse 14 actually reveals the way. Of escape. Look at verse 14. Wherefore my dearly beloved. Flee from idolatry. Did, did you see the way of escape? Let's read it again. Wherefore my dearly beloved. Flee from idolatry. Well, well, what's he saying? What's the way of escape? Flee. Come on now. Pay attention here. It's just people getting up and walking away. That's, that happens like every service. And that really needs to stop. Come on, that just really needs to stop. L listen, what he is saying here, flee from temptation. Flee, get up, get going, run. Have you ever heard the, the expression gazelle mentality? You ever heard that before? Dave Ramsey really uses that analogy with gazelle mentality. And, and, and listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that. I'm going to use that for this message. Hey, listen, when a cheetah chases a gazelle, listen, the gazelle, listen, he don't try to stay and fight. No, he's on the run. He's running. Now, now, you probably have heard of the expression fight or flight. 
Come on. Like there might be a dangerous situation where it might, where it might arise where you need to fight for your life. There, there might be that occasion to, to fight for your life when there's danger present. But, but listen, when there's a danger of temptation, when there's a danger to, to give in to temptation, the answer will never be fight. The answer will always be flight. The answer will always be flee. The answer will always be run. The answer will always be get away. Take heed lest ye fall. You think you're strong. You think you can handle the temptation. You think that you're strong enough to fight against it. No, that's why Paul says, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. Run. Get away. That's the way of escape. Paul mentions in verse 14, he said this, to flee from the sin of idolatry. Now, the reason why Paul spoke about the sin of idolatry is because there were some believers in the church of Corinth that felt that, listen, that they were strong enough to go into the temples of idolatry and, and go sit down and, and eat meat and think this. Well, well, if I just go in those temples, well, it's not going to have an effect on me. I mean, there, there was believers in the church of Corinth that thought that. And so the temptation would be this, to go inside some idolatrous temples, sit down and have a meal. That was a temptation. I mean, and they, they could probably even reason in their minds and thinking, well, after all, those idols aren't actually gods. They're not anything. Listen, I like meat. And what's the big deal if I go and just sit down and have a meal? Well, what's the problem here? So, so this is what Paul does. He, he wanted them to give attention to what he's about to say regarding what it means to eat meat in pagan temples. Okay, now look at verse 15. He says, I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. Okay, now, if, if we recall back in chapter number 8, do you remember when uh, Paul was saying that they were puffed up? That they puffed themselves up? And in chapter 8, they were basically saying, hey, Paul's saying, wow, you must be wise. You must be on next level. I mean, you must have arrived already. That was what was, was taking place there in chapter number 8. And so Paul says this, I speak as to wise men. It's like he's saying, if, you as, if you're as wise as you think you are, then here's the thing. Judge ye what I say. If you are as wise as you think you are, then you really should consider what I'm telling you. Okay? And, and, and then what he does is that he uses the Lord's Supper as an illustration for them to consider that the point he's trying to make. Look at verse 16. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Now, the word communion in verse 16 means this, fellowship. Hey, that sounds familiar from this morning, doesn't it? Fellowship. It, it means to associate with. It means to have partnership with. And so he says the cup that they drink of during the Lord's Supper that is associated with the blood of Christ. And the, the, the bread that they break that is associated with the body of Christ. Everybody with me? Okay, now look at verse 17. For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. He's saying together as a church, we are one bread. We are, on one, we are one body. It, listen, he is conveying when we assemble together for the Lord's Supper, there is unity here. We are unified together. And then that word partakers also uh, has to do with uh, fellowship, communion. It comes from the same Greek word. And so Paul is saying when we as a church partake of the Lord's Supper together, we are united as one body and we are associating ourselves when we partake of the juice, we are associating ourselves with the blood of Christ. When we break of the bread, we are associating ourselves with his body. So look here, look here, look here. When we assemble ourselves together for the Lord's Supper, Paul is saying this, we are united with this theme. We are associating, we are fellowshipping, we are communing, we are identifying with Jesus. That's the idea. That's what he's trying to say there. When we have fellowship together, we are associating ourselves with the blood, with the blood and the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, now, now listen to this. Having a meal with someone and sitting down with someone, it was like a universal understanding, like meaning this, we're in fellowship together. 
That's basically what it means. To sit down and have a meal with somebody is saying, listen, we are in agreement with one another. We are, there's a partnership between one another. There's communion with one another. And, and, and that's the idea of having the Lord's Supper. We are in partnership together. We are communion with one another, and we are identifying with Christ. Now, Paul, he even points uh, to the unbelieving Jews that they too understood that concept. They understood that. To fellowship together means that we have communion with one another. To, to, to sit down at a meal would mean that they are in agreement with one another. Because look at verse number 18. The Bible says, Behold Israel after the flesh. Are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? All right, now, when Paul says, Behold Israel of the flesh, he was referring to unconverted Jews. He's referring to uh, lost Jews, those who haven't accepted Christ. Listen, though Jesus came and he died and he resurrected and ascended back up into heaven, there were still Jewish people that did not believe Jesus to be the Messiah. They, they st there were some still believers that thought, well, the Messiah hasn't come yet. So therefore, what we still have to do is that we still have to offer sacrifices. We still have to offer burnt sacrifices like they did in the Old Testament, remember? And so what these unbelieving Jews would do is that they would take their animal, they would slay their animal, they would offer it on the altar, and they would burn it. And oftentimes what they would do is they would take a portion of that animal and they would eat it all. And all of the parties that were involved in that sacrifices there, they would all eat it together. And so basically what Paul is saying is this, even the unbelieving Jews, when they sit around their tables and they eat of the food that was offered unto, on their altar, they also understand that they are all unified in regards to the sacrifice that they made on the altar. They are all in fellowship together. They're all in communion with one another. Okay, so am I making sense here? So for the church, when they had communion, when they had the Lord's Supper, they're saying this, we are identifying with Christ. To the unbelieving Jews, when they would offer their sacrifices and eat the meat, they're all saying this. We are all in agreement with offering sacrifices on this altar. Okay. Now what he's going to do now is that now he's going to bring it home in regards to what does it mean then to eat meat in pagan, in pagan temples. Look at verse 19. What say I then? That the idol is anything? Or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols anything? Okay, now, now look here. Paul is not going back on what he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul said this, idols are nothing. That's what he said. He, he said, I, idols are nothing. They're, they're not gods. They're not deity. They're statues. That, 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 that's what they are. So he's not going back on what he said here in chapter uh, number 10. Because look at verse, what he states in verse number 20. It says, but I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Okay, now look here. This is what Paul's saying. Pay attention. Look up. He's saying this. Idols are nothing. They're nothing. Meat is nothing. Remember, they believe that if they eat meat offered unto idols, then a bad spirit can get on the meat. They eat the meat, and they're afraid that they're going to get demon-possessed. Remember that? Preached about that a couple weeks ago. So he's saying, idols are nothing. Meat is nothing. But here's the thing. Meat offered unto idols. Behind that, there's demonic influence. Meat being offered unto idols. Behind that scene... There's demonic influence. And so what he's saying is when you sit down at those tables in those pagan temples and you eat that meat offered unto idols and you're sitting around with other people eating meat for the whole intention of offering them unto idols, then Paul's saying this in, in essence, you, what you are doing is you are associating yourself with the demonic influence. What you're doing is you're associating yourself and you're saying this, I put my stamp of approval on this, just like, just like they would associate themselves with Christ at the Lord's Supper as they eat, 
Just as those lost Jews would associate themselves with that altar, here's what Paul is saying. When you sit down in those pagan temples and you eat meat with those unbelievers that are offering meat unto those idols, what you are doing is you are associating yourself, you are fellowshipping with, uh, with those that which was done under the demonic influence. And that's why Paul says this, I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Okay, listen, let me tell you something you already know. Believers can't have association with Christ and with the enemy at the same time. That can't be done. Look at verse 21. You cannot drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. No, Paul's not saying, listen, you shouldn't do that. No, Paul's saying you can't do that. You cannot do that. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. Here's the thing, church. You can't go two ways at once. Neither can a believer be in fellowship with Christ and the enemy at the same time. Listen, a born-again believer is identified with Christ, period. He is identified with Christ's sacrifice. He is identified with Christ's resurrection. He is identified with Christ's salvation. Therefore, if the believer is identified with Christ, then therefore he should identify with him all the time. Listen, and then Paul gives a warning. Verse 22. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Paul, he's asking the Corinthian believers, listen, if you think that you can associate with that under the demonic influence and at the same time be, have association with Christ, li listen, are you really going to provoke God to jealousy? Listen, God is a jealous God. He is a jealous God. He tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 2, that he's jealous. And then Paul asks him, you think you're strong? You think you're stronger than God? <laughs> Absolutely not. So you're going to provoke him? At the Lord's table, you're going to sit, you're going to sit down at, with the church family and say, well, I'm going to commune with the church family. I'm going to associate with, the, with I'm going to have fellowship with Christ. I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to associate with him by partaking of the juice that represents his blood and I'll partake of the bread that represents his body. And I, we are all in agreement that partaking of the Lord's Supper, we are identifying with the Lord Jesus Christ. But uh, also on the next very next day, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into the heathen temples and there's meat offered unto idols. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to sit down where those who are saying, well, this this meat is offered unto idols. And behind that influence is the demonic activity. And Paul is saying this. Listen, when you do that, you're really provoking our God to jealousy. You going to do that? Are you stronger than he is? And of course, the, rhetor the answer to that rhetorical question is absolutely not. But listen, church, I, I think Paul was trying to get them to understand a principle here. And the principle is this. That those who identify with Christ should not put themselves in a position to be identified with the enemy, with the enemy's ways. You hearing me? If you had to, he's saying that if you, had, if you have fellowship with Christ, then you should not put themselves in a position to where they could also fellowship with the ways of the enemy. If they have communion with Christ, then they should not put themselves in a position where it appears that they have communion with the ways of the enemy. Listen, and here's the, the application. Listen, if you identify with Christ, meaning if you're saved, if you're born again, you, you have Christ's righteousness credited your account. You, his blood was shed for you, and he is your savior, and God is your father. Then listen, if you identify with Christ, then you shouldn't put yourself into positions to identify with the ways of the enemy. Now listen, if you're saved, you have fellowship with him. If you're saved, you have communion with him. If you're saved, you have partnership with him. Therefore, don't put yourself in a position where it appears, look here, where it appears that you have fellowship with the ways of the devil. Yeah. Okay. Now, this is where I got the title of the, the message. If you're on one team, don't wear the other team's colors. If you're on one team, don't put on the other team's colors. Denver Broncos. <laughs> I'm sorry. Listen, okay, okay. Denver Broncos, what are their colors? 
orange and blue. Listen, there are some people who bleed orange and blue. <laughs> There's some people who bleed orange and blue. Okay, now I know many of you don't necessarily care for sports, but I'm preaching, so too bad. The Denver Broncos just got a new head coach. Sean Payton's his name. Sean Payton is a very successful head, head coach. He, he's a Super Bowl champion, took the New Orleans Saints to the Super Bowl and won it, and yeah, very successful. He's a new head coach for the Denver Broncos. The Denver Broncos' uh, division rivals are the Kansas City Chiefs. Patrick Mahomes. Their colors, red and white. That's what their colors are. Now, can you imagine? Can you imagine? Game day. The first game Denver Broncos plays against the Kansas City Chiefs. They run out the tunnel together. They're all unified. They're all wearing the same colors. They're all, they're all together there. But then all of a sudden, Sean Payton runs out, of the, runs out of the tunnel wearing red and white. Yeah, yeah. What's going to happen? Listen, everyone's going to go berserk. Everyone's going to flip their lids. It's going to be on news. It's going to be on Sports Center. It's going to be everywhere that Sean Payton's wearing red and white. Well, why, well why, would everybody, why would anybody get upset about that? Because, listen, to wear the other colors shows support. Shows support for the other team. To wear the other colors is saying this, we are in favor of the other team. To, show, to wear the other, the other team's colors is say this, we are identifying with that team. Hey, listen, you're a child of God. You better make sure you're wearing the right colors. You better make sure you're wearing the right colors at work. You better make sure you're wearing the right colors at school. You better make sure that you're wearing the right colors out in the community. Because this is, this is the thing. Depending on your testimony, people could tell what colors you're wearing. Listen, the type of language that you use at work, people can tell the type of colors that you're wearing. The, 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 the type of jokes that you laugh at and the types of things that you put in your body and the types of things, the type of entertainment that you watch or you listen to or the types of conversations that you have or the gossiping or the lying or whatever the case might be. Listen, people will know what colors you're wearing. They will. So here's the thing. If you belong to Christ, wear the right colors. If you belong to Christ, identify with Christ in everything you do. Identify with him. Listen, don't make the excuse. Well, I want to identify with him in all these different areas of my life. But there's just this one area where I can't get victory over. Don't make excuses. Because when you argue against that, you're arguing against God's faithfulness. So this is what you do when you're tempted to wear the other team's colors. This is what you do when you're tempted to look at images you have no business looking at. This is what you do when, when you're tempted to speak foul language at the workplace. This is what you do when you're tempted to gossip or lie or cheat or steal. This is what you do Flee! Flee! Run! Get away! Because listen, you think you're strong, but you're not. You think that you're strong enough, but you're not. But listen, don't put yourself in the, in, in the situation where you can fail. Don't put yourself in the situation where you can put on the other team's colors. Because there's a lost world that's looking at you. There's a lost world that's listening to you. And listen, if you're wearing their colors, they're going to say this. Why in the world do I need Christ if they already have him? He looks no different than I do. He looks like he's wearing the same jersey. He looks like we're on the same team. If you belong to him, care about your testimony. And don't put yourself in a situation where it just might look like you're swapping jerseys. Don't put yourself in a situation where it looks like you're going for the other team. Don't put yourself in a situation where it looks like you're a part of the enemy's way. Don't do that. Listen, if, if you're to evaluate your testimony tonight, if you're to evaluate your testimony 
Whose colors are you wearing? Come on. Whose colors are you wearing? If we were to ask your coworker about your testimony, whose jersey would they say that you're wearing? Are you listening tonight? If we were to ask the people who are closest to you. If we were, uh, listen, you can't, you can't be on both sides. You can't do it. Look here, wake up, wake up. You cannot be on both teams. You cannot come to church on Sunday and sing victory in Jesus or I'll hail the power of Jesus name or sing praises to our God on Sunday. But on Monday, when you're around the crowd, you look no different from the crowd. Listen, we know and you know what colors you're wearing. Well, I just don't really see the big deal. I mean, I've gotten away with it for so long. What's the issue? Okay, are you really going to provoke God to jealousy? Are you really going to provoke him to jealousy? Okay, let me ask you this then. Are we stronger than he is? No. No, we're not. So church, this is what we need to do. We need to make sure if we identify with Christ, if he bought you, did you hear that? He bought you. That means this, you don't belong to you, you belong to him. Listen, he's not part of your team, you're part of his team. And if you're part of his team, listen, you better make sure that you identify with him all the time. You better make sure that you're wearing the right colors. You better make sure you're wearing the right jerseys. Because you belong to him. So church, let me ask you, what does the world, just by looking at you and you just examining yourself, What colors are you wearing? What jerseys are you wearing? Hey, let's do this. Let's identify with Christ. Let's have fellowship with Christ. Let's have partnership with Christ in everything we do. Let's pray.